Welcome back, Hawks fans. Your boy Bryce Lewis back at it again for another Believe in Hawks podcast. And I know I haven't been, put out an episode in a while. It's been about a week, week and a half since I put out my last Believe in Hawks. I have taken some time off just because last weekend was my birthday weekend. So I was spending time with friends and enjoying that. And then this week, uh, I know some of you probably don't know, I actually moved to South Carolina here recently. So I've been procrastinating on some things I need to do. So I've been trying to get that done this past week before going into work. So that's the reason why I haven't really been able to get an episode out to you guys until now. So, but don't worry, we're back now. Uh, we're locked in and we're ready for for whatever the rest of the season brings to us. And a lot has happened, especially in the last 24 hours. Um, we have leaked tweets. We have and potential insubordination. We have one of the worst defensive performances I've ever seen in my life, especially on an individual player. We've the player dropping 73 in your building, highest that the franchise history has ever led up. Click Capella's Ole defense. Um, just just a lot has happened, man. Um, this week in general in the NBA has been crazy with the amount of scoring, but Last night for the Hawks against Luka Doncic, man, that that was that was not good. That was an embarrassing performance. There's no other way to put it. Uh, now they fought in the game, and the game was competitive down to the stretch. But at the end of the day, the one thing that has reared its ugly head multiple times for this team, the defense has reared its ugly head once again, and they fall now to a four-game losing streak, but still sit tenth in the Eastern Conference in the final play-in spot currently. So. Technically, again, like I tell people, the, the East is so bad at the bottom that, I mean, the Hawks can be bad and still make the play. And so that's why I'm not one of those people who's like, well, we're, or after the 82nd game, we're done. We may we have an 83rd just because of that. I mean, I'm just being real with you. We'll see what happens as, as time goes on. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see because there's a lot there and everything. So. Let's go ahead and get into it, man. So, Luka Doncic had 73 points last night. Um, he was – he had 40. He had 40 in the first half, I believe. Um, and he just – he had 60 through the third quarter. I don't know the exact word, but he was in the 60s. But overall, if you watched the game, you saw how, how terrible the defense was. Just Luka and, and the entire Mavericks team could literally get anything they wanted, like if you watched that game. Like I just was watching that game, and I was like, there is no resistance. And that's one of the biggest issues. I said this last night. I said, Hawk teams can turn up on the Hawks, and that can disrupt them. Because, you know, it, it happens. The Hawks feel like they never can turn it up against another team and disrupt them. And then that's what creates these deficits. Because in the halftime, you make adjustments. Teams decide, this is how we're going to attack the Hawks. But the Hawks, for some reason, never have a plan in the second half, especially in that third quarter, that attacks the other team. And then that's what makes everything just kind of go to crap. And now they're down 10 at the end of the third quarter, not, you know, just in, in, in just general necessity. Because of the fact they couldn't do anything to really put them over them. Everything that's happened, a lot of questions have came about Quinn. A lot of questions, obviously, a lot of pressure uh, on the front office as this DeJounte Murray trade has continued to linger. Uh, and as far as we all know, people believe, and I believe, too, that DeJounte Murray requested a trade. And it just hasn't been reported that he requested a trade, but he has indicated it to someone. That he's in, he requested a trade, and people forget who his client, who his agency is. It's Clutch Sports, one of the most, if not the most, influential agency in the entire league. It's, it's it's you think it's crazy that both Trey Young, who's also a Clutch client, and uh, Dejounte Murray have been linked to LA, where LeBron is, with his best friend Rich Paul running the company. You know, cl Clutch man, they they know how to manipulate they know how to make help their clients get to where they want to go that like we're talking about all these trade proposals that have been leaked from the hawks we keep saying who from the hawks is leaking how we know it ain't clutch that's their client they probably would know what's getting offered or what what discussions are happening with their client they're plugged in 
And so my point is coming from the game recap, because there's really not much to say about it. I mean, Hawks played well offensively, but were terrible defensively. And Luka had a 73. There's really not much to say about the game. This is about all the stuff that, that has surrounding the game and after the game. And actually during the game too. So apparently for weeks I've seen on Twitter and social media that people felt like, especially since the trade, when the trade rumors began, when they see DeJounte play, they have felt like, especially when Trey comes out the game, he has kind of taken this aggressiveness of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to prove something. I'm trying to show you something is, is what people have said. Uh, last night was probably one of the biggest, I would say, situations that showed a man who was trying to prove something. But at the same time, to the worst degree, waving off Quinn Snyder and what he wanted to do. Now, we remember, I can't remember the exact game, but a few games ago, it was like clutch moments. DeJounte waved off Trey Young for to take a jumper, uh, which he missed, but he waved Trey off, and people were like, oh, he, he, waved, he waved Trey off. That's crazy. Why would he do that, right? And then in the fourth quarter last night, DeJounte was doing a lot of one-on-one basketball. It, it listen, you know, the way he played that entire game was just – it felt like he was – he had a different mission in mind than what the team had. I think that's the biggest thing. He had a different mission than what the team had. Right? He had the biggest minus on the floor for all starters with minus 21 and the entire team. You know, he – you know, I've, I've throughout this entire process, man, I've commended Jante because, you know, he's still playing. He's not sitting here trying to not play or, you know, lack of effort or anything like that. Like he's still trying to, you know, do his thing. He's still trying to help the team win. Last night was the first time where you did feel a bit of selfishness coming from him. But at the same time, I mean, It didn't take us take us necessarily out of the game, but you 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 saw you you watched the performance and you kind of saw what was going on. Like people were tweeting, they really let this man go one on one against them. It 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 everything it, and every so so I think that ruffled some feathers uh, within the Hawks fan base. That that ruffled some feathers because when, when you have a guy who we believe wants to be traded. You always question or wonder how does it affect team chemistry? How does it affect the on court product? You know, that's, that's just the normal things you think about. Now, I don't think this is like a James Harden situation. I don't think we're at that level, you know, in my opinion. I don't think we're at the James Harden level, but clearly it's impacting the team. When you're waving off your head coach, that either means two things either you don't respect your coach or you have a personal agenda that you want to accomplish during this game, which did something, which is, like I said, will then make you look selfish because then it's like, you're not doing what's best for the team. You're doing what's best for you. So this leads to a tweet from ice underscore Trey on Twitter. His, his thing blew up last night. Um, About what happened. Apparently, apparently, DeJounte DM'd him. Um, last night, right? And well, not last night. He didn't DM last night. Apparently, this is three shots he's had for a little bit. I'll read the tweet to you guys. This is this is coming from this tweet from one S E underscore Trey. If you want to find him on Twitter, blew up on NBA Twitter. He was responding to his dad, who his dad came out last night, basically saying, "Y'all want to bash Murray? He does so much good for this team." You know, P 
people want to send me comments about him and it's dumb to him. And at the end of DeJounte Murray's dad's tweet was February 8th, which Brad Nolan tweeted was notable, which is this, because that's the trade deadline. So clearly he is aware of that. And, and that, that, that hashtag February 8th sounds like a man who's waiting for his son to be traded. So in the tweet that he put out, this is this conversation she said he had with DeJounte Murray. And it sounded like DeJounte was betting, but I'll read it to you guys. And a quote. Come watch practice and see the team that play together and then watch the other games and see another team. Also, if you want my job, come get it. I want to see you be told one thing in practice it, and used a way in practice. And when the real game starts, it's a totally different game. Come run up and down the sidelines with no rhythm and flow. Come be a spot up player. Oh, yeah, not to mention actually watch the games and see how long I'm out the games when I sit and how long I actually get to make decisions as a playmaker. Oh, yeah, come ask every player on the team this year and last year, are they happy? Then come talk to me. Y'all want stats over wins, and I can't relate, sucker. That was DeJounte Murray. Um, obviously, DeJounte deleted Twitter, so he's not going to probably address that. But this is a preface that he said he had for months that he was going to release once he got traded at the trade deadline. But because of what DeJounte's dad did, he felt like he needed to release it. Whether you agree with him releasing that conversation or not, is, is everybody's personal opinion. At the end of the day, it's been released to the public. We have it. We know what's been said. There you go. So two things that came out of that was that clearly we have heard DeJounte has not been very happy with his role. He has not been very happy with, with what's been going on. He has not been very happy with just everything. And this tweet sounded like he was venting and getting things off his chest. Clearly DeJounte feels like he has not been used in the way that he thought he was going to be used for this team. He feels that, it, that the, the way they've used him has maybe limited him and not made him more a, a more effective player. And maybe he also believes he can contribute more to winning, but has not been given the opportunity from Quinn Snyder to do that. Another thing that I took away was the fact that he said, as players now from last year to this year, are they happy? Hinting at the fact that, Maybe the locker room is not happy with what has been asked of them, what's been going on. Guys who have struggled significantly this year, Clint Capella, Shadiq Bay. I mean, DeJounte's been fine, really, so even through all of it. He actually has been fine. Uh, but, you know, basically saying that not everybody is bought in. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, Trey Young during a post-game press conference said after a loss, I believe it was after the Wizards game, I believe, he said that we need to get guys in here who are bought in. That's what he said. And it feels like now you're connecting pieces together. We're connecting the dots. We're connecting what's going on. So let's address DeJounte first. Like I said, he seems unhappy with his role. And that may be one reason why he, again, unofficially requested a trade because he feels like he's being held back. Now, openly, publicly, he has talked well with Quinn Snyder. And, and honestly, for me, I don't know if it's a matter of he doesn't like Quinn or he just doesn't like the way you're being used. Because sometimes it's just we're talking about him and Trey ain't working. But it sounds like to me that he feels like he can offer more to the team. But Quinn is not allowing him to do that, which then frustrates him because then he feels like I can impact this game more than what you're allowing me to. Another guy I'll bring up is A.J. Griffin because, remember, in Nate McMillan's system, he allowed ball handlers to be ball handlers, which is what we criticized because there was no ball movement at times. The Hawks would just stop moving the ball. That's why guys like A.J. Griffin were able to have success in the system because – I've always said AJ's more of a, a guy who has to get the ball in his hand to break defenses down. Quinn is more of a we need to make quick decisions. We need to be taking threes, going to the rim. You need to be boom, 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 boom. So he's not allowing as much 
breaking down of the defense and creation unless you're like Trey Young, right? Or like, you know, if you're not cutting to the rim, like you're basically, there's an objective when you make a move. It's not, I'm going to break you down and then do something. And so I think from that perspective, that's why you've seen AJ follow the lineup because he, he clearly, in Quinn's eyes, is not a spot up shooter. Even though he can shoot, I just don't think he's a spot up shooter. I just think the system doesn't work for him. But back to DeJounte, I think for him, he just feels like I need to go somewhere that will allow me to first go back to being a point guard, like full time, not like one and two, depending of trades in the game. Like he wants to go back to being a point guard full time. That's what he wants to do. And regardless if you like what he's doing to try to prove that point, that's what he's doing. So he's trying to prove that he can do more, but he's unhappy with what he's asked to do. And now let's go to the bigger picture. Now he's saying it's the team happy. Now we don't know how many guys. I feel like Bogey has benefited from the system. I feel like Jalen Johnson has benefited from the system. I feel like Trey has benefited from the system. We all think a Kongu will benefit from the system. Uh, but we know guys like Bay has struggled in the system. Clint doesn't fit this system. I mean, realistically, we could say DeAndre Hunter doesn't fit, but he hasn't actually had a terrible season. So, I mean, you know, I don't know where to really slide him into. We've questioned Quinn's rotations. We question certain things. It, I've said this multiple times that this team feels like they are in just this very dead space in this very dead place right now. Like we're like 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 they're waiting for something to happen. People are waiting for the front office to make a move, and if there are guys that are unhappy, then you need to get them out of there. Because at the end of the day, ultimately. As far as we know, Trey Young is bought into what Quinn wants to do. He has said before that we need people to buy him. He is so he's technically called out people without calling them by name. And you need to find people who fit what he wants to do. Because at the end of the day, if Quinn Snyder gets the players he wants, and then we're getting the results we're getting, then yes, he needs to be fired. But until he has that, until you know your team is bought into what you're doing, then you can then make that true official judgment on Quinn Snyder. Now, the Hawks are not going to probably make any trade moves. They're not going to move Hunter, and they're not going to move Capella until they move DeJounte, which is why they're just trying to move them both together if possible. One of the two with DeJounte. I don't know how, how well that's going. Uh... I I mean, you've heard so many teams interested. You've heard so many different offers. The belief still is that L.A., the Lakers, are the favorite in the entire process. But the return that we're getting is that we don't want D'Lo, so we're trying to give D'Lo to someone else, and then we're trying to maybe get a pick. And I also said that I would feel like whoever that third team is, who they try to add in to make the trade work, you would assume they would get a player from that. You would assume they would get a player from that. One deal that was tossed out there was a potential three-team deal with the Brooklyn Nets where you look at DeJounte going to L.A., D'Lo going to Brooklyn, and then we get Spencer Dinwiddie in a pick and another pick. I Again, it, I one thing I learned about trades and these trade offers and if someone likes a deal is first, do you like the player? Some guys just don't like players. There's guys who don't like Spencer Dinwiddie as a player and think that's a terrible trade. And there's people who love Spencer Dinwiddie and think that would be a great trade. At the end of the day, somebody asked on Twitter, what moves do the Hawks need to do or make for them to be to change things? And I said this to, the, to him when he asked him that question. I said, people are so focused on this season. Any moves the Hawks make are for the next season. That's why it's very important to try to get you a top eight rotation player and picks because you want to use those assets when the offseason comes to maybe make a big trade that could be out there. And also, you know, I don't know who will be out there as a free agent. I haven't looked at the list. I know there's a couple of big names. But, you know, maybe you try to put your name in those hats as well by offloading some of these contracts, depending where the cap is mentioned. And so the Jante thing is just that 
if if the chemistry is affected by DeJounte being there, you would feel like the Hawks brass has to make a move. But then at the same time, you don't want to just make any move. You don't want to just do what you did with John Collins and just dump him for for basically nothing. You you want to feel like that if we make this move, we are getting something of value that can help us in what we want to end up becoming. Now, Quinn, after the post game, Brad Rowland tweeted that he usually gives an opening statement. He didn't give one, and he took a few questions, and that was it. And to me, without him saying it, it gave me a vibe that Quinn was frustrated. Quinn will answer questions, but it felt like he was frustrated. And like I said, if DeJounte's waving you off during the game and not listening to play calls, I mean, any coach would be frustrated. And so, for me, there's just a lot of drama around this team right now. And like I said, we haven't even talked. Like I said, I mentioned earlier how bad the defense was against Luka last night. Quinn mentioned that he felt like he wanted to double him. They didn't hit him. They didn't make him feel him hard uh, uh, enough, and they didn't double team quick enough. But you know, it's it's just those performances are they're just not good. Like the last four games, it just feels like the Hawks have just been kind of like, whatever, you know. Like, I I just don't. I don't sense a team who they're just they're just playing basketball. Like there's not there's not like a goal. It's not like a mission. There's not like a like an a, there's not something they're working towards. It's like we're just playing the game. Because defense is effort. And if you're not bought in, then your defense will suffer because that's an effort thing. So just a lot surrounding that situation because it feels like DeJounte needs to be moved quick, sooner rather than later. Because we don't know if he will continue to quote-unquote go rogue. Like I said, these are all what people think they saw. People said at the game they saw him waving off Quinn. At the end of the day, it, these are just going to be he say, she say, what they saw situation. I'm not going to sit here and say that's exactly what happened. But you could tell he was playing a bit differently in that, especially in that fourth quarter. So, you know, I don't I don't know what that locker room is like. It's crazy because the locker room has been a big topic of discussion for this team. Last year, they released an article talking about when Quinn Snyder came in, the locker room was crap. This year, I'm like, okay, if it was crap last year, I mean, is it's crap again this year? <laughs> I mean, clearly we have a lot of the same guys in there. It sounds like to me you need to switch some rock guys over if it's that if it's still crappy from coach to coach. I mean, listen, I listen, have I been critical of Nate McMillan in the past? Yes. But at the same time, I know not everything was on him. I just think he played a big part in certain things. But I know everything's out on him. It's never 100 percent the coach. Players have to take some responsibility for that. So just overall. The whole situation has just been not good. The Hawks are nine games under 500. You're a game away from being 10 games over 500. It's just like people are just like, what are we, what are we doing? What is the plan? What is the direction? What does the front office wants to do? We have no idea any of these answers. No clue. And I think that as a Hawks fan is the most frustrating thing. Not knowing why am I supporting this team? What is what what is this team's goal? What am I supposed to get behind with this team? That's the big issue. We don't they don't have the answers to that question. And I think that in and of itself is what's frustrating. From bad roster construction to drama in the locker room, from trade requests, lack of defense all year. All of it just culminates together, and then you get the product that you have seen, especially these last four games, where it just feels like they're seeing very lifeless basketball from this team. It is just, I think people every night are watching this team like, what is going on? What is happening right now? Because this is insane. Literally insane. So...
you know, I, I, I mean, I'll give y'all thoughts on the situation. What y'all think going on? What are, what are your observations from everything you've seen with the team, with DeJounte, everything? Let me know what y'all think, for real. Hawks, next few games, play Toronto tomorrow. You play, do you go to what? Then you go, all the West Coast teams come to Atlanta as the Hawks are on a homestand. Um, LA, Phoenix, LA games will be the game everybody's circling because that's the team DeJounte is connected to. Golden State, Clippers, and then Boston and Philly. Very, very tough schedule coming up for this team, man. And there's no, there's no indication that they'll figure it out. February 8th is the trade deadline, everybody. So Hawks brass under pressure to make a move and see how they can just change up this team in some capacity, Brad. Because right now, it seems like everybody, the Atlanta Hawks, are broken. But that's all I got for you guys today on the Believe the Hawks podcast, man. Appreciate y'all tuning in for the show, man. Like I said, get y'all comments in the comments down below, man. Leave a review on the podcast. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Bryce Jennings for 2K. Like and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. And I'll see you guys next time.